So if you're ready, uh, we'd like to ask the moderator and the speakers to take their seats on the stage. So as you can see, we're using state-of-the-art technology for our panel discussions, so it's taking a little bit longer than we expected. So we're waiting for our last speaker. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we ask you to remain in your seats. We're going to begin the session once everybody has taken their places on the stage. Okay, I think we're ready to begin plenary session one, Creative Leadership for Green Growth. Uh, please allow me to introduce you the moderator, Mr. Tony Burden. He is the head of the Growth and Resilience Department at the Department for International Development of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Please welcome Mr. Burden with a big round of applause. Thank you. I'm about to test great the technology works. Um, thank you and uh, good morning. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm delighted to be this, uh, the moderator for this session on creative leadership. Um, so, you know, we've heard earlier from some, you know, impressive leaders of their cities, their countries, and, and globally. Um, but in recent decades, advanced economies, emerging markets, rapidly growing developing countries of, alike have witnessed a remarkable transformation in their models of economic development. Um, it's about a shift towards more innovation-based economic growth, new technologies, greater productivity. Um, innovation is perceived as being vital to enabling and sustaining long-term growth, and it's particularly key to ensuring the success of green growth. But leadership is key as well. And I think this is, you know, at a personal level, it's about all of us as individuals leading in our different areas, setting out our vision. We're all, as Mary Robinson said, prisoners of hope, setting out our vision of the future, listening to and working with others, but having confidence in our own views and ideas and taking them forward. But it's important for governments too in setting out the policies, the regulatory environments, creating the right signals, consistent and credible and long-term, that creates the platform for innovation and creativity. And this is vital for not just for higher and more inclusive growth, 
but also to shift away from the unsustainable use of our natural resources and to reduce the impacts on the world's climate and environment. And many countries will be going through this transformation. So this session will focus on the creative leadership uh, that will enable us to do this at the international level, the domestic level, in public and private sectors, through partnerships and networks, all in creating the conditions for green growth. But let me now just introduce uh, the panel that we have. Um, firstly, I'll, I'll just turn to uh, Dr. Naiko Ishii. She's the CEO and chairperson of the Global Environmental Facility, which has 182 member nations and is the world's leading international institution dedicated to investing in the stewardship and health of the global environment. Previously, Dr. Ishii has served in the Japanese government as Deputy Vice Minister for Finance and also worked at the International Monetary Fund, Harvard University's Institute for International Development and for the World Bank. I'm very pleased to have you here this morning. And then Mark Watts is the Executive Director for the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. And before joining C40, Mark was the director of Arup's energy consulting team in London. He's also worked as the climate change and sustainable transport advisor to the mayor of the city of London, where he led the development of London's groundbreaking climate change action plan and the associated program of projects to reduce London's carbon emissions by 60% by 2025. Thank you. And then Mr. Loic Fauchon, who's the Honorary President of the World Water Council, an organization he's been involved with since its creation, most recently as its president in, until 2012. He has many responsibilities in the field of water and environment, including being a member of the high-level expert panel on water and disasters, an advisor to international organizations and governments regarding the development of water policies. Thank you. And finally, to introduce our keynote speaker for this session, Ambassador Young Mok Kim. Ambassador Kim has led the Korea International Cooperation Agency since May 2013 as president. He's vastly experienced, was a career diplomat who served for 35 years with posts in a number of countries, and has participated in policy making and execution of the security and economic agenda at the highest levels. We're very honored to have him here today to give his keynote talk. And Ambassador Kim, if you would like to give us your talk. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, you have a so nice and inspiring speech from uh, Dr. Mary Robinson. I became to think that I have nothing to share with you anymore. Uh, since this session is for leadership, I would like to a little bit try to focus what kind of things, obstacles we need to overcome and where the leadership is needed. <clears throat> As uh, many of you already know, the risk of climate change is complex and multifaceted in a sense that affects all aspects of our lives from food, water security, health, sustainable growth, and even the status of international security. Rapid development of past decades, particularly that of developing countries, has only accelerated problems of scarcity of food, deteriorated quality of water and air, and has left a huge amount of waste in cities. While investment in industrial capacity to cope with these problems remain poor, and far from being needed. According to a report in The Guardian, climate change is already contributing to the deaths of nearly 400,000 people per year and costing the world more than 1.2 trillion US dollars, wiping 1.6% annually from the global GDP. In addition, the UN expert group has reported that the cost of holding temperature to safe levels may reach 
4% of economic output by 2013. It is obvious that the threat of climate change is imposing higher risk for the global south than the developed world, where countries are less resilient to irregular threats, including natural disaster. For example, all of the two, 22 countries most vulnerable to natural disaster are developing countries. Now, Mary Robbins took one example of a small uh, Pacific island, which the leaders had to immigrate people from uh, Tonga uh, and other islands. Many are in the same fate. Even though global climate change negotiations have yet to reach a consensus, world leaders hopefully are joining in the warnings of scientists and intellectuals. Prospects on water shortage and food security are now considered the greatest source of threat to international security. United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, as you know very well, has been really trying hard to uh, draw consensus among leaders on the climate summit. But you may have saw the news that he has uh, himself uh, recently joined in the civil society protests in New York at the beginning of our climate summit. Dr. Jim Kim, President of the World Bank Group, has already warned many times that large-scale battles would erupt over water within 10 years if the world community does not pull resources together on an emergent basis. Even China and the United States, you, you saw the news last week, the world's two largest carbon polluters recently announced that that both President Obama and President Xi to set a goal to control the emissions by 2013, which many experts welcome and take it as significant progress in the Climate Summit Agreement. In addition, climate change was brought up to the top of two G20 agenda in Australia. You saw the news and then you, you heard from Robinson. After President Obama urged the world to rally behind the new global agreement and United Nations Secretary General Ban called it the defining issue of our times. President Obama pledged a three billion green climate fund additionally in, a, in his keynote speech. And as you said, the other countries are uh, following his commitment. It is critical to note that some regions are actually being estimated to be at risk, at risk of a potential military conflict over water and food. You may believe it or not, people even are killing each other over water and over food, where the scarcity is severe. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry recently admitted that tragic consequences of climate change including possible outbreak of a conflict need to be taken into account in actual security and military planning. The world faces then no other option than to take action. Everyone is being asked to act, I, I believe. One thing we need here we are going to discuss is to try to shift growth paradigm towards green and inclusive growth. Green growth has been officially mentioned among policymakers since the Fifth Minister Conference on Environment Development in Asia and Pacific held in Seoul in 2005. But here we have an agreed assumption that putting green growth as a national strategy can create a new industry and help sustainable growth. Also, the strategy would help mitigate the damage of climate change and degradation of the environment. Yet, we need to be convinced. Uh, I think uh, many, particularly in developing countries, need to be convinced that this is the right stretch. Shifting paradigm is not easy, nor does it come without cost. We witness modest but hopeful signs of progress in many developed countries. I think our uh, panelists will uh, present you many good, 
good examples. Even though green growth looks to be somewhat distant agenda to many developing countries, as we understand, well-designed green growth stretch promotes technology development and application as our moderator introduced innovation-based technology and creates favorable conditions for massive investment for infrastructure. This strategy can also reactivate, I believe, dynamism of growth at this time of low growth and recession. A recent joint study between GGGI Unido revealed that investing in renewable energy generates more jobs than investing in fossil fuel-based plants. Some economists estimate that investment in green industry could add 2% of annual growth globally. Korea has been one of the front supporters of this idea. New policies have been introduced and innovative technology development has been making progress. Mandated reduction of carbon dioxide to major producers of emissions is being imposed. Now I'm going to talk about a little bit about why we need to form an in inclusive partnership. To address this complex challenge of climate change, particularly in the developing world, we need to pull together resources and capital from as wide a range of sources as possible. This past summer, more than 120 heads of state and government convened the UN Climate Change Summit to renew their commitment. France pledged one billion US dollars in climate aid to developing countries, and followed by many others, why global financial groups, private groups, backed and pledged 200 billion to fight climate change. According to Global Commission on the Economy and Climate, led by Felipe Caledron, former president of Mexico, the world is expected to spend about six trillion per year on buildings, transport, and water systems over the next 15 years. Engage the world, engaging financial market in the world could certainly help vulnerable communities and at the same time global economy recovery as well. Developing sharing new technology for low carbon and climate resilience while help, helping to build capacity for developing countries to induce investment, manage investment, and manage projects and make operation capability for themselves would make green growth stretch work and succeed. Even in many of these developing countries, there are many pilot projects which are making scalable projects possible. Therefore, we are being asked to form partnership as inclusive as possible among governments, technology firms, investors, funds, academia and civil society, and recipient government and people on the ground, and use them in an extremely creative way to make investment possible first and produce results. Uh, Mary Robbins, a few minutes ago, uh, presented her conviction for green justice. He, he, she said, we, we need to uh, pull a catalyzing action for all resources together mm -hmm. to make a stale uh, project possible and include as many as possible to uh, enjoy the uh, benefit of green industry. In the process of practice, uh, however, I have found the following obstacles exist in most developing countries, as well as many developed countries to some extent. In, first, in most cases, eco-friendly environmental projects are not prioritized. Secondly, even prioritized projects do not enjoy public institutional support, which is essential in making investment possible. Third, 
low level of awareness persists not only among the general public, but also within government. Lack or insufficient budget for equity, equity investment as owner and in, inadequate readiness for operational cap capacity are common in many developing countries. Financial resources for R&D is very limited and system is weak for technology valuation and protection. There are, some, uh, there are many other obstacles, but uh, we are facing this problem almost day to day, day, uh, day by day. And uh, I think it, uh, overcoming these obstacles come first, uh, as we see, uh, to achieve inclusive growth and inclusive climate change, green, green growth. Green growth strategy needs to be based on convictions, therefore, that affects that effects of investment in green industry and infrastructure ultimately make overall growth solid and sustainable. Overcoming this obstacle's call for a real leadership which will push forward the agenda with unswerving conviction. I think President Obama is taking one of these leadership himself. What we are doing in Korea uh, I would like to take advantage of uh, this time to uh, make an advertisement for Koika. Uh, what, is, what is Korea is doing in this efforts? In an effort to join the global endeavor to reduce and adapt climate change, Korea has led to establish the global think tank, as you know very well, Global Green Growth Institute. We also hosted and supported the GCF which is core fund that helps developing countries. Uh, likewise, Korea shares international efforts toward low carbon climate resilience economy as, well, as, as much as possible. COICA, as the uh, aid agency of Korea, has been carrying out some projects to help our partner countries. On behalf of our government, Korea, COICA has implemented a number of East Asia climate partnership programs for five years from 2008 to 2012. This includes 37 bilateral, multilateral, and PPP projects equivalent to about 150 million USD. COICA's efforts also include mass planning of a national green growth strategy for some countries, designing and expanding capacity building programs, water development and management systems, and flood prevention infrastructure, ICT-based disaster warning systems, in addition to helping renewable, efficient energy development capabilities. Uh, there are many other uh, programs to introduce and share with you. One thing we, I would like to share with you is that COICA is launching a worldwide program for rural development, which would like to include uh, more than one million from the bottom to be lifted and join in the uh, cre uh, social creation of a, a social value chain worldwide. That we call it SEMAUL, based on Korea's model. Uh, we try to transform this SEMAUL into very multiple purposed and smart technology-laden development strategy. Uh, as Mary Robinson uh, introduced you to how to make green justice can be reached, we would like to take these people of one, more than one million out of button using smart energy devices and teach them eco-friendly um, knowledge and let them use clean cook stove as much as possible in our programs. Uh, this would uh, need also very comprehensive partnership with the private sector and NGOs and companies to provide as many as uh, devices. Uh, personally, I'm going to leave this evening to New York for participating in, in this Clean Cooks of campaign. Mm. And COICA is uh, going to continue to uh, make efforts in, in partnership with many, many domestic and global 
uh, organizations and try to make all projects uh, green growth as one cutting uh, strategy for in, in many uh, other projects. So I thank you so much and leadership is one thing uh, that the big people, renowned people are supposed to play, not person like me. There are so many leaders here, ministers and, and uh, internationally well recognized and influ influential participants here. But I think leadership, uh, you can take leadership on your level. Whatever uh, is your position, you need a leadership because the leadership uh, needs a pain, cost, and commitment, and time, and your concentration. So I think as President Koika, I will take a leadership. One thing I can promise is to work with the GGGI and expand programs and to help many our partner governments to increase and formulate really favorable conditions for green uh, strategy working. So I thank you so much. And uh, I, I hope our panelists will complement my rough uh, presentation and give real expertise on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ambassador Kim. That was a really interesting uh, presentation. And you, you highlighted very clearly many of the risks around climate change. Um, but also the, the obstacles that we need to overcome and then coming back down on the sort of leadership that, that governments can play. And then you set out some really good examples of what Koika's is doing uh, in, you know, from smart ways of working and energy and so on. Really uh, an impressive range of uh, areas. And, but you also then touched at the end on personal leadership, which I think is really important. This is a huge agenda. And, and it will need all of us to act on it. So thank you very much. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go now to the, the panel session. And we've got three questions the panelists have been thinking about. Um, but they'll, they'll tackle each of the questions in turn. Um, three of the questions, looking at the role of... of um, political and business leaders in, in promoting innovation and uh, sustainable growth. Examples of creative leadership that we see in policy or investments or technology. And then finally, what are some of the barriers and, and how do we overcome them uh, in, provo in promoting innovation and green growth? So for the first question, I'm, I'm going to turn to Mark. Um, so what roles can political and business leaders play in promoting innovation and sustainable growth. And you've got some great experience from working on cities. Well, I think, yeah, I'll, I'll answer it from the perspective of, of, of city government because that, that's what I know best. The organization I represent, the C40, is a, a collection of 70 mayors of the biggest cities in the world. And, and perhaps just to put the advert in for why we should focus on cities in, in terms of green growth, if you, you take the new climate economy report that's been referred to a couple of times already today, it estimated that looking forward to 2030, 60% of all the GDP growth in the world and 50% of uh, carbon emission growth through to 2030 will take place in just 500 cities, actually a little less than that, 468 cities. So it's a relatively small number of large cities that will really determine the, the fate of the world to, to a certain extent. And I, I think we know now what we need to do in terms in order to get our cities on the path towards sustainable uh, growth. We know that sprawl is the enemy, mm -hmm. um, that it, it increases costs and, and emissions, and we need to have a model of development that is, is compact and dense. We know that our cities need to be based on a high degree of mobility, but that mobility needs to be based on, on mass transit, on public transport, cycling and walking, rather than private mechanized um, vehicles because of the congestion and pollution that follows. And we know that they need to be very coordinated, both at the city level, but also in internationally. And thinking of sort of some e examples of where those issues are being, are being tackled well, I think it comes down fundamentally to un understanding that the root um, of many of our, our 
problems of non-sustainable growth lies in market failure. So while we rightly look to the private sector to provide much of the innovation that will put us on a path to green growth, it's market failure that, is, that has got us into the position that we are at the moment. And so we look to our city leaders to help to correct that, that market failure through a combination of a visionary leadership setting a direction that gives confidence to the green sector of, of the market through benign regulation and incentives that stimulate uh, and provide a path for success for the, for, for, the, for the green part of the market, but also through direct investment. And perhaps sort of bringing, bringing those three together, if I look at, around the world at examples of cities that have really kind of cracked the model of compact city development, Copenhagen is, is the, the obvious one, a city that's regularly voted, voted the greenest city in the world or, or one of the top cities, but it's really its success is the product of, of rather strict planning regulation that has meant that major new development can only take place in Copenhagen where it is within a few hundred meters of major public transport nodes, which means you now, if you see the sort of map of density of Copenhagen, you get this extraordinary five finger model where the highest density follows the five fingers of the five major public transport routes um, into the city. Or if you're looking at the, on the, the aspect of the connectivity and mobility, I think really inspiration coming from Latin America in, in particular now, uh, Enrico Penalosa, the visionary mayor of, of Bogota, who set out the vision that a, a successful city is not where the poor are able to drive cars, but where the rich want to use the bus. And he really was able to epitomize that in, in his city through a massive program of in, investment in, in bus rapid transit, a quick, affordable means of transport um, for everybody, which interestingly now, while that's very much an idea from the global south, um, the explosion in the use of BR, uh, BRT over the last few years has resulted in the majority of bus rapid transit schemes now being in the Western world uh, rather, rather than in the south. But, but, but I, I finish just by the, the third sort of point of those kind of three C's of a successful city, compact, um, connected, but the coordinated. And, and the critical thing that one really sees in the context of the, the, the extraordinary immediacy of tackling problems like climate change is the most successful city leaders are the ones that are most open to ideas from elsewhere. So are not trying to solve everything through their own ingenuity in their own city because any leader only has so much political capital. You can only be the first to do one or two things. It's much easier to go second and learn those lessons from elsewhere. And, and to take that example of, of, of bus rapid transit, just in the C40 network, we see that through sharing best practice between cities, in a two-year period, the number of cities that had, had implemented bus rapid transit schemes went from 13 to 29. Mm. So a doubling of the number of cities in a, in a two-year period. Mm. Thanks, Mark. Really interesting. I mean, what, um, you know, what more can we do then to get these kinds of approaches practice in more cities? You've got a small, you know, they're big, but they're, that's a, a selective group of cities. How do we get that to, um, to governments across the world, to other city players as well? What more can we do on that? Well, I think, I think partly the, the, the lesson from organizations like the C40 and the many other good, good city networks is, is there's just an extraordinary benefit in getting people who have, who have the same challenges, so people, the leaders in big cities, mm. who regardless of geography and GDP, many of the problems, problems are actually pretty similar, so the kind of unique combination of universal elements. Getting them in the same room solves a lot of problems. If you've, you may be struggling to think how you're going to introduce road pricing in your city given people's addiction to their car, but when you hear mm. that London has, has achieved it successfully and the mayor got re-elected and that Stockholm has done it, etc., then it, it becomes a lot easier to follow that path, path yourself. But I, I think another which is particularly perhaps relevant to the, to the GGI is, is data and evidence. The evidence base from reputable organizations that shows that, mm. that a implementing green policies delivers so many other co-benefits than simply the environmental benefits. So delivers a stronger economy. The mm. cities that are attracting investment are, are, tend to be now the ones that are going most quickly down a green path, but we need more evidence to, to demonstrate that case. Mm. Thank you. Do Dr. Ishi, maybe just a, a quick comment from you. You were a Deputy Minister of Finance. You've been in the political area. What, how, how do you, what, any thoughts on, on Mark's comments? Actually, Okay, uh, I was really excited about his take, actually, that the, the, the 
the leaders are now focusing more on these cities because mm. apparently cities is now being recognized as a key players to bring this catalyst uh, transformational change mm. and to catalyze a lot, lot of actions. So that just hearing from him and knowing that the, the growing in, uh, recognition of the potential and the importance of the cities as a key players, that mm. actually gives us a lot of hope. And also, but it also challenges us that what kind of tra uh, platform this world is, is, is needed to, in a sense, to make those cities as a new actors or players to really um, uh, maximize their potential. And mm -hmm. there is a lot of things I think we should do between national government, the central government, versus city government, mm -hmm. because whatever the city government is so important, there is some issues that only central government can solve. So that yeah. the one of the challenges I see going forward is why that, uh, that we would like to create, uh, we want to see more and more opportunity and space for city government to play, but we also want to make sure national government can create much better spaces for, for cities. And mm -hmm. also, that then I think that then the coalition of, you already mentioned, of the business, citizens, researchers are becoming so important. So the challenge is, okay, in addition to this city's network, which is already so strong, how we can create more diverse the platform, which will be joined by those much more diverse group of mm. uh, institutions and uh, citizens and uh, researchers and uh, business. So that's going to be a very, very important challenge. Thank you. No, I think in, 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 in many countries, the political narrative on cities needs to change. So I liked how you, you've, you've pulled in there the, the national context as well. Um, and I visited Ethiopia recently, which has a, you know, a very expansionary way of looking at cities. So it's thinking ahead 20 years, 30 years. They know the growth of cities that will take place. Whatever government does, that growth will take place. But by investing now in planning for that growth of cities, they're going to create those greener, more effective cities that create jobs and reduce poverty. So it's a win-win, but you know, we need to get that across more countries and that understanding. Thank you. Maybe, Dr. Shah, I could talk to, you know, ask you ar around the second question. Um, so what examples of creative leadership do we see in policy and investment and technology that we can scale up to promote innovation as a driver for green growth? What are your reflections? I think that uh, by now everybody, particularly this committee, have come to recognize the importance of transformational change. The next decade, we'll definitely see 700 million more population, 1 billion more middle income consumers, then 50% more the global um, um, output, which will pressurize the, the, the Earth ecosystem, uh, which is the very foundation of sustainable uh, growth. So that then, uh, we have already pushed this uh, carrying capacity of our ecosystem almost to the limit. And we have already seen that the climate change, biodiversity, we have already maybe um, uh, crossed over that planetary boundaries. So that's mm. why this transformational change which we are talking about today, it's so critical. And here I, I think that the, but the, there is also good news that the, while the challenge is daunting, the several recent report, which is already cited uh, by previous speakers, like a uh, new climate economy report, mm. clearly mentioned that the, so while the challenge is daunting, it's actually possible that uh, if we will do several things right, so that uh, the report identified three key systems. Cities is one of three key systems, then energy system, and uh, the land use change. So these are three key systems mm -hmm. which are so critical to catalyze that uh, transformational change. But in order for us to see this and uh, catalyze transformational change at scale, there are key reforms in each of those uh, systems. Mm -hmm. Where you already talk a lot about cities, but we also want to see what kind of key systems, key reforms in land use, what kind of things we can do for energy. And because I come from more like a practitioner's world, I just would like to maybe share with you a quick example and, mm -hmm. and what kind of things could catalyze that um, transformational change. You talk about a lot of the cities at the very high end or that um, um, 
But I just want to give you maybe one quick example. What kind of things we could also do? These days, mayors see a huge demand of switching the street lighting from conventional, uh, um, not efficient lighting to LED, which is much better for the future. It also saves a lot of labor cost. So it's win-win. However, there is a bit of the upfront cost. So that the several of the mayors, whether they want to do, still cannot really do it. So the GEF is actually working with the World Bank to create the facility to aggregate the demand of those city mayors of switching the inefficient lamp to LED and to create this facility and tap the resources in the institutional capital market. So this is the, the, uh, the mechanism to aggregate the demand and to tap the international institutional capital market, mm -hmm. which are actually very much interested in investing those kind of uh, new, new or green uh, investment. So this is just one example how to meet this demand and supply for, for better. Mm -hmm. um, the second example is actually the land use. This is the second important system mm -hmm. I just mentioned. I just flew into Korea from Jakarta yesterday, mm -hmm. and I spent two days flying over from helicopter to see Sumatra's forest, and you would be really, really devastated to see how much of deforestation ongoing because mm -hmm. there is a palm, oil palm after oil palm after oil palm. So it's really, really devastating. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that the, now we see at the New York summit already four big um, palm oil companies in Indonesia already committed no more deforestation, or at least let's source that the, the palm oil from sustainably planted palm oil. So this kind of initiative is so important, but in order for this kind of supply chain approach to be effective, mm -hmm. you have to create a new platform of coalition or coalition willings. It's not only palm oil companies, how to support smallholders doing mm -hmm. this palm oil plantation, mm -hmm. how to work with brand like Nestle or Unilever, but maybe most importantly, how we can change the behavior of consumer markets like not mm -hmm. only Europe, but also China, uh, the India, which is a major demand uh, coming from. So how we can create the coalition of these diverse stakeholders uh, from smallholders to the, the plantation and the processing company, brand, then consumer market, then the role of the government is also very, very critical mm. to how to regulate this deforestation. So I see a lot of opportunity and uh, quite energized to see this and a political commitment, but we still need to work a lot to create and strengthen this coalition of um, willing or uh, platform joined mm. by multi-stakeholders. Mm. My last example, because this is also related to the third key system, it's energy sector. Mm. Um, again, that you know, we have seen a lot of good investment here and there, but in order for us to achieve the trans transformational change at the scale, we need to focus several key issues or sectors. Here, actually, um, the GF actually worked with the local banks, that you know, when the local banks invest in energy efficiency projects, let us make sure that you know, they are equipped with, say, energy audit that when the local banks invest in their own countries at the energy efficiency project, let's make sure that they are equipped to do this calculation of their, and the due diligence. Their investment is actually achieving uh, energy efficiency that then, um, from um, mm. um, the accounting point of view. And this has been actually quite successful in China. And we are now thinking to how to extend this kind of coalition uh, of local banks and investors and also um, mm. um, technical assistance to other big market, mm. India, the mm. Brazil. So this is another way of creating kind of coalition of the but mm. very diverse coalition which we haven't really seen much. Mm. So my contribution or my take of how to move forward and in terms of innovation, I'm not necessarily talking about single technology, mm. I'm more talking about how to create a, those coalition of willings or multi-stakeholder which unites all key players which needs to be in place to make 
uh, what trigger this transformation and change. So these are just examples mm -hmm. which I have seen, but this requires the leadership, not only political leadership from top, but the business and the citizens and the consumers market. So mm -hmm. we have to see those you know, leadership from various quarters of the world, but I'm quite optimistic. Mm. <laughs> I may be also the victim of optimism and to, to move it forward. Mm. So, thank you. Thank you, really interesting. I like the idea of coalitions. You know, we um, in, in the UK government work quite a lot with Unilever and uh, other large companies trying to look at their supply chains and their development footprint. And Unilever, they have a very strong business model. They, they want to, in all countries in the world, be the number one product that people buy. You know, it's a powerful business model, but they want to do it in a way that's sustainable and with a reduced impact on the environment and climate. And this is where we want to get more businesses uh, engaged in that way. And of course, with smallholders as suppliers, there's a, a lot of downstream effects. It's much harder, of course, with the smaller businesses and as agriculture commercializes, you know, how do we get smaller businesses then to operate in the same way? So we can get coalitions of the, the big leaders and the big companies, but, but what do we do about the thousands of small enterprises and smaller businesses? One good news from the field of my two, two days of the field trip is actually it's already those um, the committed uh, big palm oil plantation, not all of, all of them, but those committed ones actually integrate smallholders, uh, small um, uh, palm oil producers on the ground, and actually provide technical assistance of better fertilizer, how to put the fertilizer mm. better, better seed, which actually create the three times more the efficiency. So without right. them cultivating or cutting the forest, they can actually that, uh, create that's much better win-win working relationship, not a charity, but as a business model, so that uh, by integrating them in, under their mm. network or integration, that uh, I see a lot of uh, good results already happening. The farmers who uh, participated in that co coalition were uh, quite happy to see their um, yield already increase and to, to see the actual security of their business going forward. Mm. So that the ones that uh, this, uh, uh, the farmers actually see those uh, um, opportunity, I'm quite optimistic that, uh, that this kind of model could, could go forward. At the same time, it's very important for the government uh, to regulate uh, this uh, deforestation right. not yeah. going anymore. And then, then uh, once that, then, uh, if that people see the opportunity just, uh, going further and further degradation, it will actually take place. So the combination of that, the promoting this integration model mm -hmm. and co create a coalition that willing set them from consumer market down to the palm oil planters on the ground, but mm -hmm. also the government role is so critical. Let's make sure this the deforestation is not going from Indonesia to actually Africa mm -hmm. or Papua New Guinea. And unless that other government can join, that then, uh, there is always uh, kind of somebody taking advantage of lack of governance system. Mm. Thank you. Great, thanks. Well, let, let's turn, um, Loic, to the third question. What, what are the barriers that leaders face in, in promoting innovation and green growth? And what can be done to overcome or uh, lower or eliminate these barriers? And, and how do we do it quicker? Your reflections, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for inviting uh, water and energy around the green growth table. Um, the, the question, the, the, the main, the global question, uh, I think, is how uh, could uh, green development uh, have uh, solid and sustainable uh, environmental pillars? And I, I, I would prefer the term of pillars and barriers, if you agree. Um, part of the answer uh, is uh, through the availability on the long term uh, uh, about water and energy. There's uh, uh, three, three ideas uh, for this first question. First, um, we need more natural resources in the future. First, for the development, we know that. But also to protect nature, to protect ecosystem, which is a little bit new, mm. around 10, 10 last years. And uh, this gives us uh, 
uh, more important responsibility to be able to do the two in the same time. Use the resources, but protect the resource, which is not so easy. And uh, we, we need to uh, have in mind that time of easy water and energy is over. The second idea is uh, to uh, use uh, uh, traditional uh, resources, but also to promote uh, alternative uh, water and energy uh, 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 resource uh, in the future. The third idea is to reinforce the link between water and energy. Until a few years during the, the 20th century, you can see that in all countries you have different policies concerning water and concerning energy. Just since 10 to 15 years, sometimes in some countries, you have the same minister for water and energy, but just in small number of, uh, of countries. It will change because um, water needs more and more energy, more and more uh, for desalination, for pushing water uh, on mega pipes, for, to, to pump deeper and deeper, etc., to recycle. Uh, uh, water. But in the same time, energy needs more water, more and more. Why? Because we want to decrease CO2 emission. So the solution will be on hydropower, nuclear plant. E even if a, a lot of people say it's not the good way, but which way? And uh, these solutions need a lot of water a lot of water. So we saw that in the future the policy will be prepared, linked, on the duty to, to respect this green approach, this green development. And the second main question is how this creative approach could or will support um, a, a green process for a, a more sustainable and equitable, always the two together, sustainable and equitable economic and social uh, growth. There's two directions. Um, the first is to imagine uh, uh, innovative models through uh, creative research development programs. We have to change uh, our uh, programs. I, I'm chairing a, a water company uh, which is working in uh, France and abroad. Um, we are changing our research development programs to take care of this uh, double uh, necessity, double duty to use water and, and energy for development but also to protect uh, nature. Just two examples, concrete examples. Um, we uh, uh, are now uh, finding some solutions to have uh, solar energy uh, for medium sized uh, desalination treatment plants. Mm. Because you know, desalination is consuming a lot of energy. So, we, I think in less than 10 years, we could have uh, uh, alternative energy uh, to desalinate uh, water. And more than 50 countries in the world now are, uh, have desalination planes operating or uh, building. And the uh, second uh, example, which is at the, at the level, uh, give energy and water uh, to millions of schools, for example, in Africa. In Africa, you have around 6 to 10 millions, we don't have the exact numbers, of schools. We, which does not have access to water and energy. So we are working with, the French, uh, with some French uh, organization and uh, internal, uh, international organization for a program which could give the autonomy uh, to each school in water and energy. And if you are doing that, you, give, you can give more success uh, for women, uh, for uh, children to have access to education. So you see this link between 
water energy, food and health. And I, I insist to do not forget health. Sometimes we are speaking about this uh, water and energy food nexus, mm -hmm. which is not uh, a good concept. Because what used to, to feed millions of people if you let them die? Don't forget that more than one million young children die every year of malaria and hydric illness. Mm -hmm. It's more than Ebola. And we don't have any campaign. Mm -hmm. I mean global campaign. So uh, this is two uh, uh, examples. And uh, the second idea uh, is uh, to, to uh, now, um, during the next uh, uh, important meetings, to defend, to promote this idea of a PENTA alliance between water and energy, food, health, and education. Mm -hmm. And there is three important meet meetings during the next years. Here in Korea will be the, the seventh World Water Forum. It will be time for solutions. And I hope all the water and energy family, but also the political stakeholders, economic stakeholders, will come to provide, to propose uh, this kind of uh, uh, new green solutions. Second meeting is in the next General Assembly in New York, next September. What place for green solutions, what place for water and energy adapted to this creative uh, approach. And the third uh, uh, meeting is the climate conference in Paris uh, in next uh, uh, December. Uh, and I would like, I would wish and I would like to, to say that uh, uh, we would be pleased if for the first time water and energy could be at the center of the climate conference because we need actions, not only uh, wishes. And um, we uh, are trying to promote the idea of a great development fund uh, which will be devoted through water and energy to food and health. Mm. Thanks, Lloyd. Um, just thinking, you know, you talked a little bit about some of the international things we could do on that agenda. In, in many low-income countries, there's, um, you know, energy provision is quite low, water provision is low. Those countries know their populations are going to double in the coming years. What, what, what advice would you be giving to those governments about how to plan for, for energy and water? May I answer your question by returning to the first question? Uh, I've been, uh, in my young age, a mayor during 18 years. Uh, I was a mayor of a small city uh, in France. Uh, I would like to say that uh, I think part of the debate at this moment is wrong. We could not continue to say during the whole century, this century, to the population they have to go in uh, uh, smart cities with smart grids, um, there's a problem uh, uh, about demography and urbanization. If we continue this process, um, we will have, at the mid of the century, 80% of the population which will be on 10% of the surface of the globe. And it will not be possible any longer. So we will have to um, bring a, a, com a complementary debate. There is not only, only the climate evolutions. There is the demographic evolution which needs to have a more well-balanced solution between cities and land areas. That's my uh, uh, personal advice. And the second comment is to say uh, one of the most problems the family uh, and energy water has to solve is the question of sanitation in the mega cities of the poorest countries. It's like a sanitary bomb that we have uh, uh, under the feet, and we do not know uh, how we will solve the problem during the next 10 or 20 years. It needs finance, it needs governance, and it needs knowledge. And uh, I think that. Uh, the, the, uh, green, uh, the Global Green Growth Institute 
uh, could provide solutions through, for example, the 30 Bankables projects which are uh, at this moment expected to be operating during the next five years. I think it's a very good idea, a very good initiative. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, Ambassador Kim, you've been listening to the panel. Um, what, what reflections do you have? Well, I, 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 I think <clears throat> the main uh, agenda or uh, task for us to push forward is to how to make investment possible, how to change mindset, how to change policy orientation and conditions for investment. Uh, the first thing coming to my mind is uh, we must let price of electricity more hi higher or uh, more costly. A lot of uh, products in line are not becoming bankable or available where they can have the guarantee for price uh, in terms of investment return. They cannot make any investment um, decision because they don't know what price will be purchased from the electricity. Like, uh, for example, as you mentioned, water needs a lot of energy and energy needs a lot of water and shale gas needs a huge water. We, uh, as, as uh, aid organizations, are trying to invest and work with on uh, modest size and smaller size of hydraulic power plants. Mm -hmm. There is no guarantee that how much the price will be the, the output of uh, electricity from that, those plants. Mm -hmm. We can help the initial stage, but operation should be uh, with uh, either private companies or uh, companies on the ground. And we need to um, have a clear answers for many unknown risks, mm -hmm. unknown uh, conditions. So I, I think develop, developing world needs to follow the model of a develop, developed world. Developed world must be prepared to pay more for the energy, electricity. And that, that will guarantee the expansion of uh, more eco-friendly and, and green growth possible. Second thing is that many, in many developing countries, leaders are very reluctant from my point of view to, to prioritize the eco-friendly and green growth strategy in line. Because uh, for them, uh, for example, railway, um, road, um, refineries and hotels are coming first in their mind uh, in, in general. We, we are helping in many sectors, but I think even developing countries need to prioritize and, and pet projects, projects of scale in, in, in the green, green growth stretch. For example, water development and treating waste, a lot of discussion missing uh, waste, because uh, you just raised out the sanitation bomb uh, without uh, properly uh, treating waste, huge tons of waste, mm -hmm. how we can get guaranteed a, a green environment and make a green energy possible. So I would like to push more uh, waste to energy projects in many countries, in particular cities, mm -hmm. so that uh, investment uh, possible. I, I think that you know what are the conditions for investment we must teach and work with the government that why there is no investment, why people are reluctant to, to help these projects. Mm -hmm. we, we need to work with them to understand what conditions they must create for investment possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know in this world they, we are calling it uh, project bankable, but there is, there is no thinking why this project is not bankable what conditions are needed for products bankable. So we must let them think and together, and maybe IMF can help, World Bank can help, and others and, and private financial sectors can help. Mm. But we must let them understand what would be mechanism. Third one is we must let you and others to take advantage of a public organizations like us, a particular grant aid. You can use grant aid for equity of, for example, equity of recipient government as owner. You can use the grant aid for making uh, sorrow and, 
and detailed mass planning of projects mm. and use this as a, one part of asset of a r e s p i e n t governments so that the following investment can easier for development banks and private funds. Once you have a solid system, policy, and purpose building, and conditions of, for example, purchase agreement is make, being made, then I think the investment would follow mm. uh, easily. With, uh, you know, uh, World Bank and other banks have uh, set up the policy not to uh, support anymore the coal power plant, and people are supposed to more interest in green growth in mm. investment. But um, Ambassador Kim, you know, in, in a lot of countries, energy is subsidized, you know, is, is, is very cheap. Uh, water, uh, in, in, you know, many people believe water should be free. It's a human right. Um, how do you make people pay for it? So, you know, in many countries, uh, fuel is subsidized and a huge cost. So how do you create the political change then to bring more you know, reality and, and, and the right kind of costing for those sectors? Well, it is an extremely difficult question. Uh, I think if the question is uh, easy, then many <laughs> leaders have already <laughs> done this. You, you, you need to, for example, you need to construct a, a very efficient subway to minimize the uh, fossil fuel consumption on the, on the road. They, they have no money. And then even uh, subway needs a uh, huge electricity. But I think uh, constructing um, subway is much more efficient and make uh, at least a living environment cleaner. Mm. Then you, you, you spend a lot of money every day for uh, drivers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to create a condition for subway construction is possible. Mm -hmm. When I was in Iran, I, I was an ambassador in Iran. Iran is one of the countries who is spending a huge portion of the budget for subsidizing this fuel consumption and electricity. A lot of young people are, are driving every individual car. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is no bus, much of, not much available, and there is no subway constructed mm. because uh, from my point of view conditions for investment has not been defined in many countries they are asking investor you bring money and you do whatever you want i don't know mm. this attitude prevents a lot of uh, bankable projects not being realized mm. i think we must start uh, start from creating conditions and let them introducing policy which will allow investment possible. Mm. That would be the first step. Right. Loic, do you have any, any reflections on that? You know, the politics of getting the right pricing. How do we do that in countries? Oh, I prefer to let the floor to my <laughs> colleagues. Um, Dr. Ishii, <laughs> just coming to you guys and bringing you in again. You know, uh, both colleagues have talked about getting the investment environment right mm. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's making sure there's a credible, consistent platform for investment and the right signals. Mm -hmm. how, how do we get that in developing countries? Mm -hmm. um, based on the, our experience of 20 years uh, investing in environmental friendly projects in developing countries, there are two things which are critical and also very effective in getting the environmental friendly investment ongoing. The one is how to get the policy right, and uh, uh, particularly for in case of, say, renewable energy, we have a lot of successful or cases or examples uh, to help the, say, South African government, even Chinese government, to come up with how to introduce feed-in tariff. And then after that, that the private sector investment flew in. Um, so, and how to help the government to um, get the policy right, policy and regulation right. Mm -hmm. uh, the speakers are talking about how to get the right signal to the investors, so which is absolutely critical. The second important point is that then, um, how to take or the share the risk of private sector investors, which um, that, uh, when the, where that the technologies, the new technologies are not yet 100% commercially proven. 
so that the, in this case, institution, public institution like us can actually share a certain part of the policy, a policy and investment risk of the mm. private sector. This also proven to be very, very effective. And particularly, um, say, uh, well, in sub-Saharan Africa, we actually joined the hand with an um, African Development Bank. We put a small amount of grant money. They put a small amount of grant money. Actually, Denmark government put another small amount of grant money. And they use that. And we create a kind of um, a fund to take the risk of small-scale private investment in renewable energy. And uh, after um, a, a year or so, actually, the, the day uh, the project pipeline actually leads to almost one million. So that then, uh, it's more like uh, how to share the risks, mm -hmm. but also how to aggregate those um, investable that then, uh, project pipeline, that mm -hmm. then how to create demand, how to aggregate the scale so that uh, they can attract the private capital to, to that facility. Mm -hmm. So these are two key um, um, elements, how to get the policy and regulation right, mm -hmm. and how to share the risks of private investment, and particularly in this case, scale, how to achieve the scale seems to be absolutely important. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of good examples already proven to be mm -hmm. successful. We just need to strengthen those kind of cases yeah. more and more going forward. Thank you. Mark, any, any reflections from the discussion so far? Just on, on the, the last point around some of the barriers to success, Cer certainly at a city scale, access to capital I is an issue. Um, I even in, in our network, which is the biggest cities in the world, 20 of our 70 cities don't have any kind of, of credit rating that would allow them to borrow on, on international capital markets. But it's also the case that many of the, the large international green funds are only accessible to, at a national government level and not, not at a city mm. government level. So changing some of the provisions around that would make a big difference to the many, many good urban projects that are, are ready to go but are lacking finance. But th there are some more micro le level issues, I think particularly a, ca a capacity one. I mean, there are so many good projects that I see in our cities that make complete sense in terms of improving the quality of life in the city and, and, re and reducing emissions and pollution but the, the city lacks the expertise to get them to, in a, a business ready, to get them in a, to a state that are seen as bankable projects by the, by the private investor community. And it's relatively small amounts of money that would help mm. cha change that position. There's, there's m most definitely a, a, an issue of scale, and I was very interested in, in what uh, Dr. Ishii was saying around aggregation mm. for LED lighting. There are so many other projects like that where the market's not very interested in, in one city's relatively small project, but combining five or six of them together, uh, and they start to become, um, become interesting. But I guess a last, a last one is there are some perverse incentives out there. Um, we, I was in, in um, South Africa recently, and talking to, to the mayors in both Joburg and in, in Cape Town, where a large part of the city's revenue is derived from the sale of, e of electricity. Um, so the very commendable energy efficiency programs that the city had started to implement are now being curtailed because they are reducing the revenues to the city to the extent mm -hmm. that it's starting to cut into the, some of the social programs that the city wish, wishes to deliver. I mean, clearly this is a, a nonsensical situation, but one which the city alone isn't able to, to break itself out of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious that the audience has been very quiet, very attentive, uh, listening hard. Um, but there's lots of people in the audience who, who also um, you know, have some experiences that they could offer from Korea or, or Ethiopia. We heard about Copenhagen earlier. Um, are there any, you know, can we take two or three uh, questions or, or uh, you know, statements of um, some examples that we'd like to hear about? Who's um, brave enough to put their hand up and make a comment or something? Great, I see two, um, two one hand there and one hand there. So I don't know if there are any um, microphones just coming now. Great, there's a colleague just in, in that row there. If you say who you are and uh, 
to introduce yourself. Um, John O'Brien from uh, Australian Clean Tech and also the, the Global Clean Tech Cluster Association, which is a group of 50 uh, technology groups and 10,000 technology pro solution providers. So um, and we're doing some interesting work on LEDs, and I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards. Um, the question coming from Australia. Um, uh, question is what advice do you give to political leaders who back themselves into a corner on environment um, and maybe how do you help them to, to come along on this journey without losing too much face because it, it's, it's a difficult position once you've got there so how do we how do we help uh, our leaders uh, move towards a, a, a better outcome thank you um, how do we move our leaders any quick reactions is, is he asking to give it up advice to the Australian government? Um, we're not talking about the Australian government specifically, <laughs> but just how do we move our leaders to get on top of this agenda? There's, there's lots of opposition, lots of interest. Well, I mean, j just generically, I mean, one of the, th the, the whole basis of the organisation that I lead, the C40, is, is that the best way to uh, accelerate green growth programmes in, in one city is for them to talk to other cities that have, have delivered something mm. successful. And you, you really sort of do see when you get groups of, of mayors together, the confidence that is given by a mayor who's able to stand up and, and describe a problem that's very familiar to, to many of his or her peers, which most of them have not <laughs> had the bravery to be able to tackle. And the mayor is able to stand there and both explain technically how they delivered it, but also that they, um, that they got re-elected after, after having done it. I, mm. I remember very vividly the mayor that I work for, Ken Livingston, the mayor of London, standing up in front of a room full of, of United States mayors and describing the, his, what was then the proposed policy of, of congestion charging, of pricing for cars traveling in central London, in London which was greeted with, mostly with laughter by the, the mayors who thought he was making um, a joke. And he, he asked them at the end of it, you know, as you have, you've now heard what I'm, what I'm proposing, how many of you think will, you'll, will do it in your city? And not, not a single hand went up. And then he said, well, how about if I do it, it works, and I'm re-elected, how many of you will do it? And then a few started to go up, not many. Mm. Mm. No, I like that. I worked in, in Nigeria for three years, and the, the governor of Lagos has really transformed the city, um, you know, with infrastructure, improving transport, and so on. But what, what's also happened is that tax revenue has gone up. As the city's flourishing, as services get delivered, tax revenue increases, the city becomes a bit more independent of central government. And that governor was re-elected. Uh, and then the, the next day, there were six other governors asking him to visit so that they could learn from his state what he'd done to improve his city. So that's a perfect example. Dr. Shi, you had a... Comments. Actually, uh, it's a little close to what Mark already said. Uh, we are trying to create a kind of narrative to try to convince mayors to take bold actions. And there are certain investment, if they see that the raise uh, um, increase in revenue, it's easier. But certain mm -hmm. projects actually, unfortunately, takes much longer time for, for uh, pr pr uh, fruits to be produced. One link to to encourage the mayor uh, to, to take, for them to take action is actually citizens' voices. Mm -hmm. If they really want to uh, to live in the livable and uh, the cities and how they want to see their, not only them, but uh, their future generations to live, it seems run. And also the business, from business point of view, if they want to invest in a huge um, um, a factory in, say, cities which may be sinking <laughs> sometime soon, that seems to be another link. So mm. to, to bring the citizens' voice or the business voice who have actually the longer <laughs> the, um, um, duration and rather than mayors or the political mm. figures seems to be one forces to, 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 um, to bring in. Um, in. In terms of industry, the gentleman talks about the clean tech. These days we are creating a lot of coalition on, of the industry basis. Enlightened project is an, uh, the coalition among ha actually lumps that, that I have seen and the C4 all initiative that uh, let's create an uh, um, at the coalition of household appliances, refrigerator, air conditioner, and even boilers, so that uh, for that kind of a coalition to work, actually consumers' voices are also very, very important. So key seems to me going forward how to create this transformational change, how to bring those people's and the consumers, the business 
voices which are not usually hard <laughs> mm -hmm. to the platform. It seems that is the key to, 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 for us to move forward. Right, thank you. Um, there was another question over here. I don't know if the microphone can come. So, um, John, John Matthews from uh, Macquarie University in Sydney. So maybe uh, before we close the session, could we just draw attention to this remarkable agreement that was reached last week between the presidents of China and the United States, um, where China commits to increasing uh, the renewable energy proportion of its energy budget from 10% to 20% over the next 15 years. Now, from what I've seen of that agreement, it uh, requires China to engage in an unprecedented uh, renewable energy building program for enhancing infrastructure of 1,000 gigawatts over the next 15 years. So that's building a new power station of a, um, based on clean energy of more than 1 billion watts every week for the next 15 years. So I wonder if the, any, anybody on the panel would uh, like to comment on this as, a, as an example of creative leadership where green growth, in this case the building of renewable energy infrastructure, is absolutely central to the leadership involved. Mm, thank you. I think that might be you, Dr. Shimaitane. <laughs> no, actually we are all quite excited to see that kind of top le global leadership to, to come together. Of course, we have also observed some kind of noises <laughs> back home, so that then it's important for us to, to see. But this kind of leadership are really, really waited for long. And today, Mary Romizno said about, we need two things. One is a global leadership to create an international agreement, which gives us a lot of signaling effect uh, for mm -hmm. business, for consumers, for cities. So that is, uh, we were equally e excited to, to see that kind of an, uh, Mm -hmm. um, the action, but also she mentioned this on how to catalyze the transformational change is equally important. And I hope that kind of coalition at the global leadership yeah. creates more opportunities for us to catalyze those transformational change, which also requires a leadership, not only top political leadership, but as mm -hmm. I mentioned maybe 10 times already, the business and the consumers, citizens, research community, city mm -hmm. level, subnational government. So to me, I was really excited to, to see that coming. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Please, Ambassador Kim. Yeah, uh, <coughs> I, I think China is uh, changing its course. Uh, this is my observation uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, Chinese uh, public has begun to feel the, the damages of uh, development, particularly air pollution, um, no enough uh, sanitized water and many other concerns are coming to the table of uh, uh, dining table of Chinese general public. So Chinese government uh, has to manage this problem and uh, introduce a new policy as far as I know to impose a quota or s uh, score um, component in the assessment of uh, in individual cities, how to make air pollution mitigated, how to make progress in, these, in these, those areas. Mm -hmm. This is a, uh, some, some policy which you have not known before. Uh, secondly, um, urbanization was one of the big uh, national agenda as one part of a strategy for Chinese new leadership. But without any proper policy for addressing the poverty, uh, health care, waste problem, and water, and, and air, they cannot make really a uh, sustainable uh, urbanization plan. This is what I think Chinese leaders and public both clearly understand. Uh, why we talk about China? Because China is not only is the first ever increasing emission polluter, but I think China is one test bed for humankind at this time, as he said, uh, while preserving natural register, uh, resources, but use natural resources massively, is China. You, you have a large, huge population, you have a huge demand for development still, but you have a limited resources. I think uh, 
uh, instead of pushing China, it's my personal, really personal view that we must work with China so that China can really manage a strike a balance between preservation and, and use. Thanks, Ambassador. Um, we've got a couple of minutes now, so I wouldn't mind just turning to the, the members of the panel. Just to finally close with just um, you know, a short statement of key things that you'd like the audience to take away with them. How, how do we get creative leadership in, in green growth? Given you short notice, but Mark, could I turn to you? What would you be your takeaway? Well, I uh, go back to where I started, which a big component of the green, green growth debate needs to be what happens at an urban level, uh, creating sustainable cities based on a, a compact and, and connected uh, development path. But I, I was very interested in, in the points raised around sort of natural capital. And I think one of the things that's yet to be properly sort of thought through in terms of urban development mm -hmm. is the connection between ecosystem services and rapid yeah, urbanization. Yeah, yeah. And that will be a, a big issue for the next five mm -hmm. to 10 years. Great, thank you. D Dr. Ishii? Yeah, uh, today we talked mostly about climate change, but uh, as I mentioned very briefly in my opening, actually climate change is just one of the symptoms of the phenomena that our activities is actually pushing the health of the Earth ecosystem to its limit, so that we have seen already the biodiversity loss and the coral dying, the forest is gone, which is undermining the very foundation of our future. Mm -hmm. And as you said, and as other speakers said, the fundamental reason why we have this problem is we just take the nature as granted mm -hmm. and without mm -hmm. price. So that when we make any decision, that the, as consumer, investor, the producer, we don't really take the yeah. value of the natural capital. That's why we have this problem. There are quite several initiatives already ongoing how to put the prices of natural capital. The mines of, of course, natural capital accounting. Mm. And when uh, people do start a project, certain group are already starting to how to, to, to incorporate those and the value of the natural capital, but we need to see more and more on this kind of thing, which mm. actually creates the fundamental transformational change. I was quite interested in hearing um, the, the ambassador's comment about Chinese now trying to do this an eco-civilization. Mm. I think the reason is they do understand exactly without yeah. that kind of transformation, complete change from consumption, the production to the way they live, they can't have a sustainable future and mm -hmm. that is a sheer fact and mm -hmm. they are actually quick quite quick move forward mm -hmm. so that then uh, uh, i think that then we also have to learn and have to have it and then uh, in our system how we can change our way of actually that then uh, mm -hmm. doing business and how we live it so a lot of good example that we need a leadership from every corner the quarter of the world to make it happen great thank you uh Loic from because I see we have we don't one have minute left, it says. <laughs> uh, globally, I, I think it's time now for Green Growth to move from uh, expert uh, uh, conference to, to, to make Green Growth the business of all. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Kim? Well, I completely agree that we must bring the Green Growth as a thematic uh, conference and discussion to a real action mm. and business, as he said. This is my conviction. And Organization like us to connect, role is to connect between uh, public money, public mm -hmm. resources with the private resources. We must uh, uh, be able to play a linchpin role or a crystallizing role, whatever, that uh, our role must be very important. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Well, um, just I hope you can join me then in, in thanking the panel for a really interesting discussion and presentations and, and I hope you found it very useful as well. So thanks very much everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Mr. Tony Burden. I think under your guidance the first panel discussion was a resounding success. So thank you very much. Well uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, we're going to now have a short coffee break but before I let you go uh, after this session we're now going to break out into three groups. There's going to be 
three panel discussions. Uh, track A is on this floor in Lotus Room, Lotus One, and it will be covering the issue of green climate finance, uh, uh, sorry, technology innovation, excuse me, technology innovation. And track uh, B, which will be covering green climate finance, is also on this floor in room Lotus 5. Now, uh, on the fourth floor, track C, social inclusion, will begin in the orchard room Three and uh, in the morning, Miss uh, Mary Robinson talked about social inclusion, and the session will look at how social inclusion can be mainstreamed in our discussions and at our organizations. So we're going to have coffee break on the third floor and also the fourth floor. So if you're interested in Track C which is social inclusion, uh, we encourage you to take your coffee break on the fourth floor. I think it will make uh, things a little bit easier and less crowded here. So social inclusion is on the fourth floor and we also have coffee prepared outside of uh, Orchard Room 3 on the fourth floor. So please enjoy your coffee break and we will see you back here at lunchtime. Thank you.